and welcome. It's Elite Business Live 2024, streaming around the world and live here in St. Paul's. If you're just joining us, welcome. Uh, we're on day one of our two-day event this year, and I'm delighted to say our next speaker when it comes to entrepreneurship is the real deal. The business he founded, HomeServe, went on to be in the FTSE 100 and exited in a multi-billion, yes, four billion pound sale. He is now supporting many, many entrepreneurs. He is the founder and chairman of Growth Leader, and he's also the owner of Business Leader. So I'm going to have my pen and paper out making copious notes as we welcome to the stage Richard Harpin. There are eight things that I know now that I wish I'd known at the start of my entrepreneurial journey 30 years ago. And if I had, maybe I could have taken that 50,000 pound startup to a four billion pound business in 15 years rather than 30. And I want to tell you this morning what the eight secrets are to building a billion pound business. And it starts with, let me take you back to school. We're taught at school that copying is bad. But actually in business, copying is a really good thing to do. Find a business model, copy it, and improve it. So let me take you back to 1976, when most kids aged 12 were making airfix kits. I was tying flies for fly fishermen and selling them to the local fishing tackle shop. And I thought, I can make more money by importing the materials and selling those to other fly tires. And I did that, a mail order business in the days before the internet. Um, but the bit I enjoyed the most was three days at the National Game Fair, exhibiting my wares, meeting my customers face to face, and a bit of research. The wives and girlfriends and sisters of all the fishermen said, those flies would make really nice earrings. So that was my first pivot from fishing flies to high fashion earrings. There was a government scheme at the time, a free bit of marketing advice, and I was going to call these earrings danglers. And this person said, you can't possibly call them danglers. It infers something unseemly and organic. You should call them hookers. <laughs> so uh, snipping off the end of the hook, kidney wires on, putting these earrings in little plastic bags, selling them in hair salons to teenage girls. And I had 10 pounds as my marketing budget. Did a press release and it said, Hookers set to hit UK high streets. <laughs> and we got on every TV station, every radio channel. Uh, we got on uh, the front pages of every newspaper. And it was a fulfilling proposition that lasted about nine months. So the first example of a great pivot. But it wasn't the business that was going to be big that would make my entrepreneurial career. And I thought, uh, I believe in studying, so I went to York University to do an economics degree. But you know what? I learned more from joining the Industrial Society and going down a coal mine in Selby, going to visit the uh, Sam Smith's brewery tour. I don't remember much about that trip. And going to the Buckstead Chicken Factory. And those were great experiences that you store in the back of your head and think, I'll take some learning from those. So I'll come back to that at the end. I think going and doing immersion visits is really important. But more education, I decided Procter & Gamble in marketing in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. And do you know what? That was about the best three years of my career because I had a peer group, 12 other graduates learning about soap powder, I was on the brand assistant on Fairy Liquid. That's why my hands are so soft. And uh, we were learning, we were socializing, but there was that peer group, which quite often you don't get as an entrepreneur. 
it can be really lonely. But once an entrepreneur, always an entrepreneur. So I wasn't content with just working at Procter & Gamble. Uh, we started, a business partner and I started buying properties in Newcastle, doing them up, letting them to young professionals buy the individual room. But the biggest problem, Friday evening, for some reason, all the tenants would call up saying, we've got a block drain in the backyard. There's water pouring out of a radiator or the boiler's broken down. And we could not get a Geordie plumber for love nor money on a Friday evening in Newcastle. So what did we think? Aha, this is our big idea. This is the one that's going to make it. So we hired a couple of Geordie plumbers, set up a business called A1 Fast Fix to get us in the front of the Yellow Pages section for plumbing and for heating. And we put £50,000, our life savings, into this plumbing business. The issue was people only have a plumbing emergency every five years. And unless you overcharge the customer for the emergency, which we were not prepared to do, then you don't get any repeat business. And the high cost of Yellow Pages meant the business started losing money. It was losing £10,000 a month. Within five months, we'd run out of money. The bailiffs arrived to take away our office furniture in 1992. And we thought, there's got to be a way we can survive. We need to pay that money. We need to pay the staff wage bill. So we started thinking about um, how do we get an investor? And I thought there's a good link between water utilities, a lot of those were being privatised in the 90s, and a high quality plumbing service. So we went round all the big water companies in the UK and said, we've got this great business, will you put some money in? And they all said no. With one exception, South Staffordshire Water in north of Birmingham. And they said, we've been looking at a plumbing service, we'll put in half a million pounds for half the business. And so we saved it. Except I didn't change the business model. All I did was grow the same model, but with an investor's money. So every month the business got bigger and the break-even line got further and further away. And the losses grew from £10,000 a month to £50,000 a month. So within a year, we were back in that same position. We'd run out of money. We were down to our last £10,000. My friends and colleagues were saying, Richard, your days of, of an entrepreneur are over. You better go back and work for Procter & Gamble. And do you know what? When you're really determined and you want to be an entrepreneur and make it big, this was my last shot. I'd done loads of other businesses. I couldn't walk away from this one. And I think when you're in a corner, sometimes you get a bit of luck. And I came across Sutton Water in Surrey, and they developed this plumbing insurance scheme. £50 a year, cover the underground water pipe in people's gardens. Difficult for a local plumber to find the leak and dig up the pipe and replace it. And I did my market research. I sat with some of the customers that had bought the program. And they told me what they liked about it and what they didn't like. And we added some more bits in. And with the final £10,000, we sent out 1,000 mail shots. And 38 people sent in their cheque for £50. A 3.8% take-up from direct mail. I remember to this day getting on my office desk in front of the 23 people that knew they were about to be made redundant because we'd run out of money. And I said, yes, we've made it. And we had. Almost the rest is history. We rolled out the business to more water companies. And the business started growing. And we turned a half million loss into a three quarters of a million profit the following year. But I was still young and naive and still learning. And I thought, I need to get some help. And this is where coachment comes in. Combination of mentoring and coaching. 
As a Newcastle supporter, I know the value of a coach. Uh, we're going through a hard time at the moment, but we've had some success and that will improve under Eddie Howe. But I needed to find a coach that could help in America. We'd opened there, big opportunity, but many businesses fail in America. We'd gone there in 2003. By 2010, we were still really small. The business was only making $10 million profit. And I spotted a guy, Nigel Morris. He was a Brit, but he was Americanized. He lived in Washington, D.C. for 18 years. He was the co-founder of Capital One, which he launched in America before he brought to the UK. And I started writing to him and emailing him. And then I sent a DHL package saying, uh, strictly confidential and urgent. Still, I couldn't reach him. He was my dream mentor. And so I started calling him. And one night at 11 o'clock, 6 p.m. East Coast time, Washington, D.C., he answered his phone. I said, Nigel, you don't know me, but I've been writing to you. I'm a struggling British entrepreneur trying to make it big in America. Please can I have just one hour of your time? And he said, I remember all of those emails. Sorry I didn't respond. Persistence pays. Next time you're over, I'll give you an hour. I said, Nigel, it just so happens uh, I'm in Washington, D.C. tomorrow afternoon. And of course, I wasn't. I got on the next flight out of Heathrow. I was in his office at 2 p.m. the next day, and he gave me three hours of his time. And he just asked me some simple questions, as mentors do. Um, so where are you based over here? I were in Miami because that's where the underwriter and claims handler is. Uh, they're Spanish, Matt Frey assistants, logical place, Miami. We wanted to set up a desk in their office to keep the cost down. Shook his head. Absolutely not. Uh, if you want great Americans, Northeast Coast, Boston, New York, Washington, D.C. And he was right. I found that all our staff that we'd recruited either wanted to go to the beach at 4 p.m. or smoke dope. We wanted serious Americans. So we relocated to Norwalk, Connecticut, north of New York. And that helped us hire a great team. His other question was, who have you got as your chief exec over here then? I said, oh, this fantastic guy, Jonathan King. He ran the UK really well, uh, sent him out here. Absolutely not. You need a local. Americans only deal with Americans. They won't take you seriously. And he was absolutely right. I got a brilliant chief exec, but he wasn't American. So I listened and we hired an American. And today we have an all American team. Uh, Tom Rusin sitting there, hired in 2011 still runs the North American business today. Last year, we made $240 million of profit. That's the importance of a local American. <clears throat> We're on to secret number four. And this may sound a bit strange in a digital age, but it's bricks and clicks and paper. And let me give you two examples. So uh, a business that I chair, I've reinvested 20 million of my own money back into Checker Trade. Everybody know Checker Trade? Anybody want to um, volunteer to sing me the jingle? <laughs> OK, I'll let you off. Um, great business, 16% of the 50 million web visits we get a year are generated by the 16 million homes we send an A4 folded bit of paper to four times a year, with 150 trade telephone numbers in there that are tracked, so we can see how many calls those trades are getting, and it sends people, prompts them to go to the website. So paper works with digital. Anybody heard of Warby Parker? Optician, specs business in the US. They were sitting around the board table and um, growing online only business. And they said, what about if we open a store in New York? And most of the people around the table said, that won't work. Why do we need that cost? It will cannibalize our online business in the New York zip codes. 
And do you know what happened? It did the reverse. The number of web visits in the New York zip codes went up because they put a picture of their New York store and the address, and uh, that helped them to have more credibility. So more visitors, some of them that had seen the store but went online, the benefits of omni-channel, and not only that, the conversion rate went up from 2.5% to 5% because they got more credibility of showing the fact they were uh, a store business as well as online. So we're halfway through the eight secrets. Um, the next one is really, really difficult for entrepreneurs. Just let's have a show of hands. How many entrepreneurs have we got in the audience? I'll include myself there. So uh, a great number. How many of you have hired your replacement? You brought in a CEO or a COO? A few. That's great to see. Um, it took me around about eight years to hire my replacement. And another seven years before we became a billion pound value business. And I worked out that um, I'm not good at running a day-to-day -day business. I needed somebody that could focus on doing that, which meant I could work on the business rather than in the business. And Jonathan could focus on, uh, he was appointed as MD of the UK when we were only a UK business. There's somebody else that did it much quicker uh, far bigger muscles than me. Anybody know who that is? Ben Francis at Gymshark, set up in 2012. Only three years later, he recruited Steve Hewitt, senior exec out of Reebok, to be his chief exec. And only five years after that, Gymshark was worth that magic billion. Ben Francis aged only 31. Unusually, um, Steve Hewitt got called into Ben's office, and in Alan Sugar's language, he said, Steve, you're fired. Uh, I've learned everything I know from you. I want to be chief exec of my business again. That's pretty unusual, but hiring your replacement is really, really important. I've touched on this one already. Go global with locals. How many of you, show of hands again, are running an international business? You're selling in other countries. That's great to see. That's really important for the UK economy to be able to run a global business from. But you need to have locals. If you want to be a serious international business, you need to have a few people on the ground in your most important countries. And that's what we did in uh, bringing our Brit back to run the UK and hiring that uh, great American. Secret seven, evolution, not revolution. Every business needs constant evolution all the time, change, improvement, small steps forward, not revolution. Revolution is dangerous. Look at the businesses that didn't evolve. We know those names there. They're either gone or they're a shadow of themselves because they didn't keep evolving their business model. There's another business, and do you remember when Steve Jobs unfortunately died, the business was worth, Apple business was worth $100 billion, and people said, we're worried that Apple won't have a revolutionary new product, and they haven't really. AirPods, Apple Watches, the new goggles, but mainly they've made the money from Apple Music, Apple Services, and that's been evolution, not revolution. And as we know, Apple today has a market capitalization of two and a half trillion dollars. We wanted to do an evolution in home surf. Somebody called me and said, there's this business in America, Richard, called Home Advisor, and it's sort of a platform for tradespeople. Take a look. I thought, that's interesting. That would be a great evolution for HomeServe. I wonder if there's anybody doing that in the UK. Did a bit of research and came across this business. And this guy, he's called Kevin Byrne. And he established Checker Trade. He was a graphic designer. There was a tornado 
on the very south coast of England where he lived, and all the cowboy roofers and builders came into Selsey to rip off the homeowners on roofing and glazing. And he said, I'm not having this. I'm going to put together a leaflet of vetted and checked trades, which then became a website, uh, which then developed into the checker trade business that we've got today. So a great evolution of the home assistance membership model to do kitchen replacements and bathroom replacements and so on. And the final secret, before I give you one extra for free, so there are actually nine, is follow a not to-do list. But again, let's have a show of hands. How many people have a to-do list? Most of us, because it's all about getting stuff done. But let me just take you back to February 2020. And I'm a great believer in curiosity and learning. I'd read a book called Good to, Good to Great by Jim Collins back in 2004. And I wrote to him and said, I'm a big admirer of yours, Jim. I think home serve is good and we're on the cusp of becoming great. And I'd just like a day of your time, one-to-one, -one, in Boulder, Colorado, which is where his laboratory is. And he sent me a voice tag back saying, and I won't do my best American accent because it's really not very good. Um, sent a voice tag back saying, um, I can't see you one-on-one, -on -one, but we have a chief exec's retreat only once a year when he's not talking to 10,000 people in an auditorium, but he values having 20 chief execs round his board table. I'd like to offer you one place. And I sent him a voice tag back saying, that's very generous of you, Jim, but can I bring my American chief exec with me? Because he needs to hear your messages firsthand. He's running the biggest business now, not me. And so we got two places on that course. I was sitting at the board table and next to me was Jack. And Jack was a billionaire Australian, made his money in food services. He was in his early 70s, but he was still on that course learning. So he was sitting next to me. And when Jim was talking, he whispered in my ear and he said, you know what, Richard? We're foxes. We're always looking for the next opportunity. And as Jim would say, we need to be hedgehogs. Very focused with a clear plan. And if anybody comes along with a harebrained idea, we put up our prickles and say, no, get lost. We're focusing on just delivering this simple business model and doing it bigger and better. So I want you to just think about three concentric circles. The first one is, what are you passionate about? And that will normally be your business purpose. Secondly, what can you be the best in the world at? And it doesn't actually have to be in the world because if you're only operating in a region in the UK, how can you be best in that region, better than your competitors? What's your unique selling proposition? And make sure you've got that. And then thirdly, I'm a Yorkshireman. I know the value of making money. So what's your economic engine? How are you going to make money out of your purpose and what you can be best in the world at? So then what you need to do, as we've done in HomeServe, is come up with what's called your hedgehog strategy. Answering those three questions in no more than 20 words at HomeServe, we make home repairs and improvements easy by matching customers' needs with trades to generate repeat and recurring income. If anybody in HomeServe is doing something that doesn't fit with that strategy, they need to stop doing it, and that's the importance of having a not-to-do list. How many people in this room have a not-to-do list? <clears throat> I think that's because you've already got a copy of the Eight Secrets booklet, but <clears throat> well done. And you need to have a not-to-do list is even more important than having a to-do list. There's only one entrepreneur I know that is very good at being a hedgehog. Anybody know who this guy is? Simon Aurora of B&M. 
They bought B&M for half a million pounds in 2004. By 2023, when Simon stepped down as chief exec, it was a five billion value business in the FTSE 100. And <clears throat> I met him and said, Simon, I'd just like to understand what drove that level of success. And he said, stopping people from doing stuff and complicating the model. We got a really simple model in B&M. We sell well-known brands like Fairy Liquid and Cadbury's Chocolate at low prices to people on low income, but then we have impulse purchases of gardening products and pet products that we make a higher margin, impulse purchase, that's our model. So all we need to do is just open more stores, and they got to about 800 stores. So he was almost the business prevention officer that kept them really focused. So those are our eight secrets, but I want to give you one extra for free because I'm a marketeer by trade. And I think it's almost the most important one. And that is, all of you that put your hands up as entrepreneurs in this room, it's your character. What drives you? What's really important? What are things that I look for in entrepreneurs and chief execs when I'm hiring or when I'm putting my personal money behind the 10 entrepreneurs that I've backed uh, here in the UK? And I put up some entrepreneur pictures there, and you'll recognize those names. Dyson, Mary Perkins from Specsavers. And if you can't see that middle picture, then put your glasses on. Should have gone to Specsavers. And Richard Branson. And hopefully they'd have a lot of those characteristics, resilience, persistence, curiosity, non-conformity, low ego, courage, and integrity. Those are the sort of characteristics. Don't try and change who you are. Hire somebody to do those bits of the business that you don't enjoy and double down on those sort of characteristics that will make your business turn into a billion pound success in the way that I'm helping other entrepreneurs to do that by investing my own money. 70 million pounds I've put in behind those 10 and 100 million pounds more behind another 10 over the course of the next couple of years. The thing I feel most passionate about and my final message is we talk a lot in this country about startups and SMEs and that's great. But the businesses I really want to help are those medium enterprises where it's about scale-ups. We have 110,000 medium companies in this country, but only 7,500 large companies that have over 250 employees. They employ 10.6 million people, 39% of the working population, and account for 53% of our exports. So all we need to do is turn medium-sized businesses that you're running into large companies, and that will mean that our nation, our country, will go from strength to strength. And we have a duty to do that. I feel a duty that I didn't want to sell my business and retire to a desert island. I want to help you to go big, inspire breakthrough, and help you become large companies. And the way I want to do that is I'd like to invite you all to become founder members of Business Leader. You do need to be turning over three million pounds already, employing 15 people, and have an ambition to grow and become a large company, and maybe even make it to that magic billion. So uh, if you're interested in that, then do apply and we can help through making it less lonely as an entrepreneur, we will give you a peer group of nine other entrepreneurs in your area and a facilitated mentor to meet face-to-face -face eight times a year. We will do live and webinars of business training on the top things that will help your business to grow and learning trips back to the industrial society at York University. First one of those is uh, Gillette a day with the global chief exec of Gillette, uh, meeting his team, understanding how a fast-moving consumer goods business operates. So many of those trips. Um, if you'd like to go to the business leader, stand outside here.
and pick up your free copy of The Eight Secrets and some examples and a bit of a workbook then, uh, please get one of those free. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you so much, Richard Harbin. A field trip. Stay with us, Richard. Stay with us. I've got a question. Here we go. A field trip to Gillette. I'm sure that will gel very nicely. And um, quick question for you, Richard. Thank you for that, by the way. Can we hear it once again? Richard Harpin, everybody. I thought it was first class. Thank you. If you are standing at a fork in the road and you've got a big decision to make, any advice on how to make that decision? Yeah, great question. Uh, the answer is collect some data, do some market research, get out there and talk to customers, but only collect 70% of the data and then make the decision based upon that. There's too many people I see that need uh, perfect information 100% of the data, yeah. so they never actually make that decision in the fork on the road. Yes. So collect as much data as possible, analyze it, take time to think about it, make the decision, galvanize your team, oh. and then go for it fast. Good enough, first class, 70% and go. Love it, Richard Harpin, thank you very much. And will you stay with us for our next panel conversation? Yes. That'd be great. Everyone, yeah. one more time, Richard Harpin, come on. <laughs>